Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 2011 National Endowment for the Arts Opera Honors. For those in the auditorium, we ask that you silence all electronic devices, but no need to turn them off completely. We invite everyone watching this evening to join us in the Twitter sphere using the hashtag NEA Opera. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. With that familiar cry, tracking the one that marks the opening of a court session, I am pleased to call to order this fourth NEA Opera Honors. Now, if the reason for my appearance is not immediately apparent to all of you, may I remind you of the law's considerable part in grand opera plots. A few, a few examples. Simon Bocanegra's resounding first act plea for law and order. Flaby, Patrizzi, Popolo, Della Faroce, Storia. And Peter Grimes' opening scene in which a lawyer interrogates Grimes about the death of his apprentice. Then Billy Budd's shipboard caught Court Marshal convened by Captain Veer, the Salem witch trials recalled by Honorary Robert Ward in the Crucible, Joseph Kay's committal by a magistrate for an unspecified crime in Dare Process, an opera drawn from Kafka's unsettling work, and of even more recent vintage, Ethel Proudlock's trial in Kuala Lumpur staged in an opera called The Letter, produced at the Santa Fe Opera in the summer of 2009. Pagan law guides the priests in Aida when they condemn Radames for treason, and pagan law is enforced by the assemblage that condemns Norma for breaking her vows. Church edict prevails over civilian rule in the confrontation between the Grand Inquisitor and King Philip in Don Carlo. A trial in apartheid South Africa will be recreated this summer when the Glimmerglass Festival produces Lost in the Stars. Political prisoners, victims of injustice, and prisons abound in opera. Think of Fidelio, Trovatore, Faust, Andrea Chenier, Tosca, Dialogue of the Carmelites, The House of the Dead, and scores more. Wills are plot turners in Gianni Schicchi and Sor Angelica. <laughs> and then once customary law, the droit de Senghur, is reluctantly abandoned by the Count in the marriage of Figaro. Lawyers show up, not to best advantage, in Deflator Mouse, Corgi and Bess, and a hilarious new opera, Valpone. Carmen features a plea bargain engagingly portrayed by Domingo K. Fritch's young artists at yesterday's lunch celebrating the honorees. The crafty, lawyer-like Loga negotiates a contract between the Giants and Votan, the dire consequences of which are revealed at great length in the ring cycle. <laughs> well, enough to illustrate the many and various links that draw lawyers to opera. On a serious note, may I remind you that opera in the United States is not funded by government as it is abroad. To survive and flourish, opera in America must have the support of fans like you and me. 
That support has been boosted by NEA's opera honors. For four years now, the government agency, whose mission it is to foster the appreciation and advancement of the arts, has presented a grand tribute to people who make opera great. With appreciation to NEA for tonight's program, may I ask you to join me in a rousing bravissimo for tonight's honorees. Please welcome Chairman Rocco Landisman. Respectfully take off my hat, I guess. Please join me in thanking Justice Ginsburg one more time. <laughs> Yesterday, along with five of her fellow justices on the Supreme Court, she hosted a luncheon for this year's honorees. It was the most wonderfully Washingtonian celebration you could possibly imagine and it was made possible with the additional generosity of Adrian Arsht. The National Endowment for the Arts exists for people like Justice Ginsburg, her fellow jurists, Adrian Arsht, and most of you who have a long and deep love of the opera. But it also exists for people like me, Cardinals fans, who might have some competing interests tonight. <laughs> uh, some of you are here tonight uh, only because you're somebody's date. Uh, not, because you, not because you know opera in a deep or passionate way. Well, the NEA also exists for people like us. And in fact, our four honorees have spent their careers dedicated to both kinds of people, the fanatical and the potentially distracted. <laughs> our honorees have made an art of reaching out to new audiences. John Conklin's set designs have enticed people into, op into opera houses with their boldness and innovation. Spate Jenkins has made the Seattle Opera House a true and welcoming community center. Robert Ward got the attention of theater goers like me with his setting for The Crucible. And there is maybe no one who has done more to entice new audiences than Reza Stevens, who appeared with everyone from Bing Crosby to Ed Sullivan. In the spirit of Reza Stevens, I'm pleased to let you know that tonight's celebration is being streamed live both via webcast at arts.gov, as well as on the WFMT radio networks. As you heard, we are even, um, we're even live tweeting, tweeting this event from the NEA's at uh, NEA Arts account with the hashtag NEA Opera. At the NEA, I'm very fortunate to work with an extraordinary body, the National Council for the Arts, who makes sure that we continue to innovate and reach new people with both traditional art, traditional art forms and new technologies. I'm pleased that so many of them are with us here tonight, including Ben Donenberg, Aaron Dworkin, Lee Greenwood, Joan Israelite, Charlotte Kessler, Irvin Mayfield, Barbara Ernst Prey, and Frank Price. We are led in our work uh, on opera by the NEA's extraordinary director of music and opera, Wayne Brown, along with the support of his colleague, opera specialist, Georgiana Paul. Almost every office at the NEA was involved in some way in making tonight possible. So I'd like to acknowledge all of the agency staff. And mostly, I would like to thank everyone who has gathered tonight here at the Harmon, next to your radio or in front of the soft glow of your computer for keeping opera alive and vibrant in this country. There is an organization dedicated to that very mission, one that works tirelessly to spread opera to every corner of this country, Opera America. They have been the NEA's partner in making tonight's po tonight possible. And I would now like to welcome on stage their president and CEO, Mark Skorka. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. On behalf of Opera America, I'm very pleased to welcome you to this historic and most enjoyable celebratory event. From your program book and the greetings of Chairman Landisman, you've already heard a little about this evening's honorees and we'll learn more about them shortly. 
Their personal stories of vision and determination will inspire you. National Opera Week, supported by the NEA and coordinated by Opera America, begins this evening and runs through November 6. Nearly 100 opera organizations, including major companies and small ensembles, will offer a variety of free events throughout the week, including backstage tours, pop-up performances in unexpected locations, and even singing contests. This nationally coordinated, locally implemented project is designed to broaden the appreciation for the accessibility and excitement of opera and opera companies across the country. You can visit Opera America's website to learn more about activities near you. As you listen to the amazing accomplishments of the 2011 NEA Opera honorees, recognize that their aggregate achievement is greater than the sum of their individual success. Together, they have helped to make opera a truly American cultural expression. They've generated a collective passion for our art form that has resulted in the creation of, a, of, an, of an opera infrastructure consisting of hundreds of opera companies, conservatories, and training programs that's unique in the world. They've inspired thousands of singers, composers, designers, and administrators who want to make opera the center of their lives. Audiences for opera, too, have grown exponentially in the decades spanned by their stellar careers thanks to their leadership and the enthusiasm engendered by their outstanding artistry. The talent, high standards, and discipline of the recipients have enriched the nation. We are tremendously grateful to the NEA over the last four years for allowing us to celebrate the leaders in our field and for demonstrating to the nation that the arts are and should, continue, and should continue to be a national priority. The format of this evening is a little different from prior years. Following the presentation of each award, you'll hear more from each honoree in conversation with NPR's Nina Totenberg. Ms. Totenberg is among the most recognized and trusted voices in American media and is herself a great arts enthusiast and advocate. On behalf of the board and all the members of Opera America, thank you for being here this evening. I hope you'll join me in saluting the 2011 NEA Opera honorees and in welcoming Nina Totenberg. Good evening, everybody. I am really thrilled to be here. I am the daughter of a professional musician, a music lover, and an opera lover. And I can't imagine any place better to be tonight, except maybe the World Series. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is really so much more fun than being on the radio or television. <laughs> but you didn't come here to hear me. You came here to hear lots of other folks and about lots of other folks. And to hear, I think I want to also say a special thanks to Opera America for making all of this possible. So for now, I'm going to demur and defer to what the scriptwriters inevitably call the voice of God. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome mezzo-soprano Heather Johnson and pianist Michael Bateser to perform an excerpt from Robert Ward's The Crucible.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chancellor John Macheri. In honoring Robert Ward, we take this moment to honor the emergence of America as a great central creative force in the world, for we, as a nation and as a culture, had found our collective voice, not only politically, but also artistically. The musical language the world has come to understand as American and the establishment of that language are due in part to the music and the tireless work of Robert Ward. He was born in 1917. Aaron Copeland was a teenager, as were George Gershwin and Duke Ellington. Leonard Bernstein would be born two weeks before Robert's first birthday. Great things were about to happen in music making in our great country. Young people were about to create the vocabulary and the syntax to tell our own stories in concert halls, theaters, and opera houses in the world. Robert Ward has written symphonies, chamber music, songs, instrumental solo works, and above all, operas. In hindsight, we now know that he is part of a golden age of opera in our country. He shared the world stages with his contemporaries, Carlisle Floyd, Lee Hoiby, Virgil Thompson, Mark Blitstein, Douglas Moore, Giancarlo Minotti, and Sam Barber. He took a language formed from the unexpected genius of a Brooklyn-born Aaron Copeland, the son of two Russian Jewish immigrants, as well as the unexpected genius of that other Brooklyn-born son of two Russian-Jewish immigrants, George Gershwin, 
and found his own voice even though he was neither born in Brooklyn nor is he the son of two Russian Jewish immigrants. <laughs> From this and a great roiling firmament of influence and tradition came the American sound and the Robert Ward sound. His operas performed around the world continued to tell American tales in an American voice and we celebrate him for that. But we're also here to celebrate Robert Ward, the citizen artist, the man who has served on countless boards, panels, and advisory committees, and who created the operational structures of a brand new school in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, where I currently serve as chancellor. The University of North Carolina School of the Arts was a dream a dream that goes back to the Greeks, an academic university created exclusively for artists so that young people of talent from high school to graduate school could be trained in a multiple conservatory campus to become citizen artists themselves, receiving academic degrees and the skills to work in the professional arena as employable and employed artists. UNCSA was only a year and a half old when its founding president, Vittorio Giannini, passed away. It was left to Robert Ward to make the idea a functioning reality, which is exactly what he did. This extraordinary school, which is about to celebrate its 50th birthday, owes a fundamental debt to Robert Ward. Its founding president, Giannini, was an opera composer, and the man who created most of its functionality is an opera composer, and as the former music director of four opera companies myself, it all feels like I am in some great opera company as I attempt to follow in their footsteps and find the implications embedded in the founding principles of that great institution. In the spring of 2012, UNCSA will continue to celebrate Robert Ward when our A.J. Fletcher Opera Institute will produce Bob's most famous opera, The Crucible, in collaboration with our local professional opera company, the Piedmont Opera. But now, please join me in watching a video that gives you an even better view of the achievements of our dear friend and colleague, Robert Ward. music sounds American. He has his own original voice. He bucked the trend where a melody was out. He stuck true to his credo and created an impressive body of work in every form. Opera, chamber music, symphony, art songs, music for band. It's really one of the great American musical success stories. My life has been blessed with more of these things that just happened at the right moment. He came up in an era where uh, composers had really begun to embrace their Americanness and celebrate their Americanness. But World War II, I was sent to Fort Riley, Kansas for my basic training. Then I found that I had met three other composers and three writers, and the Commandant wanted to meet with a group of us. And he said, do you suppose you fellows could write an all-soldier musical? Well, the silliest question we ever heard. <laughs> so they had a 56-piece swing band, because that's what they like to dance to. It was my whole experience in jazz, because at that time, Eastman and Juilliard, neither of them did anything with jazz. And the moment they heard that the war was over, of course, he was so happy, because they were scheduled to go to Japan. So this feeling became music, the jubilation overture. Columbia and Juilliard and was the head of Galaxy Music Publishers here in New York and he was a very active and respected composer. By the time he got around to writing his first opera, which was an opera called He Who Gets Slapped, and it made quite a success. There was a tremendous amount of anticipation for it because it seemed like a very bold move. Uh, because you have to realize that American opera as such was very, very recently on the scene. That was such a wonderful feeling at the New York City Opera at that time. So one of the singers said to me, well, I'll tell you what will make the greatest American opera of all. It was 1959, and a 
remounting of Arthur Miller's play, The Crucible, was being done off-Broadway. I was never so moved in a play in my life. Robert Ward was a very socially and politically concerned composer. The Crucible seemed a perfect vehicle, a fictional play spinning off the true Salem witch trials as an allegory to the McCarthy era. I was going to get that. I think that he may have been very partial to Elizabeth Proctor because she has some of the best music in the opera. There's a very pastoral feeling, and it's this beautiful kind of Americana. Robert Ward has really understood the cadences of Arthur Miller's speech. I will be your only wife or no wife at all. I mean, that's powerful stuff. And I found myself at the end of the aria literally shaking her containing the emotion and yet letting the emotion go it was exhilarating that rugged sounding american language gets transferred to the music it manages to heighten the drama of the play as music certainly should in opera uh, without distorting the uh, the play at all the minute he rips the paper up and that music starts, I just would lose it every time. It's incredible writing. I'm sure right now somewhere in the world, someone is performing or rehearsing or listening to The Crucible. Considering the amount of operas that Americans have written, it's a miracle. And if you're lucky as a composer, you get a signature piece. And as Bob will tell you, he's written some operas that are at least as good and he thinks better than The Crucible. Abelard and Heloise is a very striking work. It was great success in Charlotte. The board was sure it would be financial disaster that nobody would come, because it was new. They asked me if the opera was going to be any good. I actually called up Bob and said, I want a yes or no answer. Is the opera going to be good? And he said, yes. And I went to the board. I still can't believe I did this. And I said, uh, I talked to the composer, and the opera's going to be good. In the 1960s, he was lured south and became the chancellor and then a professor at the North Carolina School of the Arts. A search committee went through the best composers in the world, interviewed every one of them, took quite a while, and it was real consensus. The only person on there who could do that job is Bob Ward. And there was no question. Bob Ward could talk to anybody. He never talked down to the student. He challenges them tremendously, but in a way that they can actually really excel. For a teacher to treat a student just like an equal, students really respond to that. If we hadn't gotten the right man, who knows what would have happened. He put the school. It's permanent track with all of its ideals intact he pushed it ahead he is engaged with heart whether it has to do with the school whether it has to do with the university program whether it has to do with building an arts council he just embraces the community if you win the Pulitzer Prize I think you have a right to have some heirs but that's it's not Bob's style he will give someone who is a secretary as much attention as he will to the chairman of the board. That's Robert. I don't know whether he would call himself a populist, but that's a noble ambition. It's something that is really sophisticated, but the amateurs and the civilians will love it too. And that gift, the common touch, to reach both sides is a very special gift. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome me in welcoming this great man, Robert Ward.
is John Mocheri. I'm just clear. I just want to say thank you, John Mocheri, for that eloquent introduction. That was a pretty big prelude. Uh, now, uh, Mr. Landsman, Mark Stokes Gorka, distinguished members of the National Endowment for the Arts in Opera America, family members and friends, fellow honorees, ladies and gentlemen, phew, it is with a great, <laughs> it is with great pride and humility that I am here with you this evening. And I am especially pleased that it took, uh, only took me 94 years to get here. Thank you. My career began in Cleveland, Ohio, when I was a young lad who grew up during the Great Depression, but was blessed with a family which encouraged my ambitions to become a composer. With their assistance, I was fortunate enough to attend the Eastman School of Music and then the Juilliard School where I studied with the finest teachers of that era. But then, World War II landed me in the Army as Private Ward. <laughs> uh, I, I was stationed at Fort Riley, Kansas, where I wrote music for the all-soldier show, The Life of Riley. Kansas, uh, or then as ward officer JG, that means junior grade, uh, I uh, was sent to California to conduct the seventh division military band and jazz groups that gave me my education in jazz when that influenced many of my later works. At war's end, I returned to New York completed my formal studies, and began my professional career. The springboard to my professional life was a work I wrote during my army days titled Jubilation and Overture. We knew the war was coming to an end, hence the jubilation. With its success, a wave of commissions followed, and while I was also teaching at Juilliard, in those years, Howard Hansen at the Eastman School, Douglas Moore and the Ditson Fund at Columbia, William Schumann, who was revolutionizing Juilliard, and Julius Rudell at the New York City Opera, which launched two seasons of American operas funded by the Ford Foundation, and this made it an exciting time, particularly for ambitious young composers. Once again, good fortune came my way when I met Bernard Stambler, a wonderful librettist. Uh, our first collaboration was based on a play, He Who Gets Slapped, and its success led to three more including a Ford Foundation grant to set Arthur Miller's powerful drama, The Crucible. With the inspiration of a great libretto and the gentle prodding of Julius Riddell, we managed to complete the opera something like eight days before its premiere in <laughs> 1961. The opening night's audience recognized reaction brought great satisfaction as they leapt to their feet after the final scene and applauded enthusiastically at length. I modestly remained seated, but uh, uh, after a short time, the lady next to me uh, uh, leaned over and she said, young man, don't you realize what you've just heard? <laughs> uh, 
I smiled and then said, let me introduce myself. <laughs> I'm Robert Ward. And uh, her reaction was one of very evident and pleasant surprise as was mine when she replied, well, then, congratulations, I'm Thea Dispecker. <laughs> and thank you for the great opera you've written for my singers and for everyone that's here tonight. So, uh, I had some additional good fortune which resulted as the Crucible received both the Pulitzer Prize for music and the New York Music Critics Circle Citation Award in 1962. With these and the support of my wonderful wife, Mary, and family, I then spent 10 happy years as a music publisher, uh, seven years as chancellor of the innovative North Carolina School of the Arts, and finally taught campus composition at Duke University until I retired. During these years, I managed to write six more operas and seven, five more symphonies and uh, numerous instrumental, vocal, and choral works. Throughout my career, I have also always tried to imbue my works with a deep concern for social and ethical issues. For this reason, I have sought to infuse my operas with not only exciting drama, but also qualities that speak to the noblest aspects of human nature. So in closing, I would like to thank all of those who have made this evening possible and express my deep appreciation to all who have been such a wonderful and important part of my life. Thank you. Thank you all. here, I should say that he has the one prize I've always wanted, a Pulitzer. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mr. Ward, you have composed so many wonderful and beautiful and melodic and Americanish works for which we are all deeply grateful. But this is supposed to be a short interview. So I'm going to take you back to the crucible. Now you went, as we heard in the, in the film about you, you went to the theater, you saw the crucible, you were deeply moved by it. You called up Arthur Miller to talk to him about getting the rights, essentially, to write an opera, and he put you in touch with his agent. Now tell us what happened. Well, uh, we, uh, Mr. Stamper and I, not being... Uh, experienced in dealing with uh, the way of these agents for, so we decided we would just uh, get a lawyer to uh, be big time. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, uh, after two meetings that the lawyer had with her, he called and he said, look, Bob, he said, uh, I'm not getting anywhere with her. She doesn't seem to understand what this is all about. And uh, he said, I, well, I don't think we can get anywhere unless you could speak to Arthur Miller, because he was very positive about it all, and have him speak to her. So that was done, and we went in uh, to the net, and he said, hey, Bob, I want you to go to that next meeting and explain. Well, I had done a little research. I had researched uh, and found that 
Uh, one of the things that she was demanding that the work be written in uh, in one year and performed, and then be performed by at least four major opera companies every year thereafter. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, I had done a little uh, research, and I found that Puccini and Strauss each took about, oh, and this had to be done in a year, and I found that they each had taken about four years to write their major operas. So I told her that, and uh, all the other things that uh, were, didn't encourage us to be opera composers. Uh, but then I said that there's one thing I wanted to tell you. And I said, you know, Puccini uh, wrote his, well, one of his great operas, and uh, it was based on a, a novel at that time. Uh, and uh, he's just ending after 75 years of his agents uh, earning millions every year, and this was Tosca. <laughs> and, uh, she didn't know who the writer was at all. <laughs> But that made that solved everything right there. That sealed the deal, huh? Yeah. Well, I'm curious. Uh, when you do, you look for inspirations like that as a composer, or do you ever just sit bolt up, upright in the middle of the night and go, "I have an idea." Well, I tell you, I think most of the composer I know do do get an, uh, an idea in their head. But one of the things that almost all of them have told me is that they have to get up right away and get it on paper because it doesn't last long in your hair. <laughs> so uh, I have had those ideals, ideas and uh, have run. But basically, I really work from the play or the uh, place that the story comes from, and the quality of the language and the basic subject matter, whether it's comedy or whether it's tragedy, and uh, uh, then it goes on from there. So did you ever meet Marilyn Monroe? No. As a matter of fact, what, what really settled things, uh, uh, well, when after... Uh, I had, we had gotten the message to him that we were interested in this. Uh, we gave, uh, had the theater uh, put three tickets in his name for himself and his lady friend at that time, who was, you know who, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, uh, and then we, uh, and, and also his producer. Well, it happened my older brother, who was in the theater in New York, uh, happened to know that producer very well. So we got our first uh, 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 app of ability to meet Arthur Miller. And so uh, we got talking very well. One of the first things that turned out is that when he thought about all the, the uh, story, he thought this would make a better opera than a play. <laughs> and he said he had started to hear music for the dance business in the first act. And uh, so he was a good friend of, uh, of uh, Mark, uh, the playwright, uh, good friend. <laughs> This is my age. Well, it's all of our Anyhow. <laughs> Anyhow. <laughs> and uh, so he called Mark, and he said, uh, Mark, uh, how long did it take you to write a good play? And Mark said, oh, hell, Arthur. He said, uh, I don't know how many years. How long did it take you to, to uh, uh, write a first good play? And he said, oh, I, 20 years. And Mark said, well, it'll be at least that long again. 
to learn to write an opera. And with that, Arthur Miller slammed the phone down and said, thanks, Mark. <laughs> so he got you to write it instead. Well, congratulations on your wonderful award, and thank you for all of your wonderful work. Well, thank you, and thank you all. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Robert Wurzel. Good evening. John Conklin. You know, it's so appropriate that John is the first designer, the first visual artist to receive this award. John's greatest contribution to opera is not only creating things we are able to look at, though he's done and created much stunning work. For me, John's most important legacy is his distinctive way of seeing uh, his vision for what is possible in this highly collaborative art form. John is constantly exploring, constantly looking, constantly asking, what if? John can see the larger arc in a work and bring that to the surface. He can see beyond the physical requirements of a scene and envision the many meanings that text, music, action, and image can have, and the way they communicate with each other and with us both intellectually and emotionally. John's mind is also always full. He can pull ideas and images from what might seem at first to be contradictory sources. You know, we worked on a show where there were all these red chairs hanging on all the walls. And I walked in to focus and I said, what are all these red chairs hanging on the walls? And I'm asking, well, maybe I thought that John's trying to say something about the fractured, broken nature of the world or, or, or some emotional state of the singers. It was very poetic and very metaphorical and had visual weight, so that was something. And so when I asked John about it, he says, oh, yes, yes, it could be all those things, but it's also just a chair. <laughs> Ten years had passed by the time John and I began working on Lizzie Borden at Glimmerglass Opera. Sitting in the theater one day in tech, I hearing the music, experiencing what sickness under the surface of the family drama, we had a sudden impulse to bathe the stage in a sickly acid yellow light, which turned out to be exactly the right thing to do. The piece spoke to us. It started to tell us what it needed to, to, ha needed to be done. John gave me that insight and understanding, and for that I will always be grateful. I know I speak for so many of my colleagues when from my heart I say, John, thank you for your vision. And now, let's view this video tribute to a man that has shaped this world we call opera. Thank you. I love going to John's apartment. He is surrounded by books. He's surrounded by music. Books everywhere, and CDs everywhere, and models everywhere. It's this big toy chest of him. His curiosity is something you can't contain. It's always, what if we did this? It's never like, well, we can't, or no, or any of that. It's always, what if? He's always questioning, always looking, interested in something new. He'll say something like, do we really need the overture to Dutchman? I think the greatest quality that any artist or anybody in the world can have is curiosity because it will just keep leading you further and further and enriching your life further and further. When I think of what he did with Of Mice and Men, which was not like Il Re Pastore, not like Verter, not like any other of the productions that John had done, except it's like all of them somehow. He's such a varied designer, it's difficult to pick one thing, often something red. <laughs> he liked that. Give John three red chairs and he's going to make a Tannhäuser with it somehow, miraculously. Most designers create scenery. John creates space, especially in opera where music is telling so much of the story and there's an abstraction already in the fact that people are singing their innermost feelings. John was able to manipulate and control emotional space as opposed to physical space. 
Once I had my first taste of John, I felt like I'm always referring to the kind of dialogue that we've had in all the work that I do. There was a hunger that both of us satisfied, I think, in the other, in some funny way, in the work we did together. I would have a big idea, or he would have a big idea, and then we would just run with it. When it's working, you cannot say whose ideas these were, or where these things came from. When we did Il Re Pastore, he showed me a model. It's a very simple, sort of childlike thing. These little boys come out and they write Il Re Pastore and they conjure up these six characters and it's all from the perspective of these children. And it was so refreshing. It reminded me again that you don't need all that other stuff. A simple idea presented well is everything in the theater. The system is all sort of screwed up because when you're a young designer first starting out, you should have lots of money. And then as you get older, you get less and less because you begin to trust the energy of the performer and of the event rather than stuff. What would happen if we took away from the production budget and added a week of rehearsal? That that might, in the long run, be more valuable? And as complex as his mind is, there's also a very youthful little child inside, and he loves to play. Any production is a very volatile and complicated sort of chemical lab experience. And if you put one drop of something, it will change the whole thing. And sometimes they will produce gold, sometimes it'll blow up. Not to just sort of play around for play around's sake, but to play around because that's how you learn. What I think John's strength as a designer and as an educator is, is that you're going to keep exploring the idea until you nail it. He doesn't let you cut corners. Everything the audience sees or hears or feels is part of the event. And always wait for that moment in a production. It happens sometimes, but not all the time, where the production will start to tell you what to do. John always says you never know if a wig is right until you get the orchestra in the pit. You have to see everything together and see what it does, not what you told it to do and not what you thought it was going to do. You see what it does. And then you go, oh, right. Now it's telling me to do this and telling me to cut that. And it says, that dress should be red. Something's going to happen backstage where a piece is supposed to come on and for some reason it comes on backwards. But John loves that it comes on backwards. And so then you have to figure out how to do that every time, which it wasn't built to do at all. Again, from the production said, I want to do it this way. Look at this. This is the way I want to do it. As tiring as it sometimes was, it always got better. I think John does not aim to inspire. John pulls you with him in his wake. He had a way of getting everybody to be as deeply invested in the project as he was. He had such a huge following among the interns, and they had so much loyalty towards him that we could make anything happen on stage. And he invested so much joy into designing the company float for the 4th of July parade. That's very much the view the community gets of the opera, and so it was great that he would always work so hard on it. I learned from John as much as all those young people working at Glimmerglass. He really opened a lot of people's eyes to what greater potential there was in the telling of stories in the world of opera that could make the pieces more vital to all of us. He has shared his passion, ideas, real love of opera with generations of young designers. I don't think I could still be doing this if it wasn't for the joy that John brought to the process. That first 18 years of my career in theater with John is what I, I will continue to work towards getting again. If I could establish another opera company someplace, I'd do it for John because his ideals, his goals are just exactly what I think opera should be. He's more influential than I think he even realizes himself. And nobody, but nobody has that touch. He's made opera modern. Unlike architecture or painting, it gets thrown away at the end, which I think is so wonderful. I mean, people say, don't you feel terrible when they've taken away? Say, no, no. It does not exist without the performance, and then it only exists in memory.
Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. John Conklin. especially to those who so kindly and generously participated in Greg's video. Um, yesterday at our fine NEA lunch, Justice Kennedy spoke of the response of a visiting high school student when asked what she thought of Washington. She replied, it's a stage set for democracy. <laughs> for many architects to have one of their buildings criticized or dismissed as a stage set might be the ultimate insult or indignity, with its intimations of temporality, torn apart and shipped to a dump in New Jersey, or the evocation of sham, falseness, superficiality, or a glib stab at meaning or profundity. But can't the metaphor of the theater cut deeper? After all, our greatest playwright often called upon the theater and its illusions as a profound image of our progress from role debut to final bow. Couldn't the Parthenon or St. Peter's or the Forbidden City or the Pyramids or Washington DC be described as stage settings without too much irony? Visual images that concretize complex and even mystical thoughts, feelings beyond words. From the soaring palaces of the Bibianas in the 18th century to the virtuoso recreatings of Franco Zeffirelli of a Roman church or a Chinese palace to the deeply spiritual and cosmic settings that Wieland Wagner carved out of space and light at Bayreuth. The theater has tried to express our deepest feelings and emotions, desires, hopes, joys, through visual evocation. And Washington, from the impressive bulk of the Capitol to the stark minimal vision of the Washington Monument to the radiant Greek temple at the mall's end. And from the side rooms in this memory palace, the White House, the Jefferson Memorial, the new FDR complex, to that most dark and yet exultant tragic vision, Myelin's Vietnam Memorial which I might call without, with sincerity and deep seriousness, a great piece of theater. Perhaps this really is a stage set for democracy. And in this turbulent era of stress and anxiety, of despair and true suffering, are some of our leading players not performing at their peak, missing their cues, misspeaking the text, and are we in the audience sitting too passively, quiet in our seats? But what of that Brechtian drama underway amid the grandiose scenery, scenic outlay of Wall Street and its many out-of-town companies? <laughs> Does the grandeur of our setting seem out of scale? And yes, too often too bitterly ironic? Can't we all study our parts better? Speak them live them with more skill and conviction and with more poetry and eloquence that we might truly and honestly inhabit our own drama of democracy. Thank you. thoughts and wrote that since lunch yesterday. <laughs> you could be a, a reporter on deadline. <laughs> so I've always wanted to ask some impertinent questions of a, of a set designer, and so here I have one of the greatest of all time. So can, let's start with this. Can you tell me one of your favorite stories about a total set disaster? Well, I'm not sure it was a disaster, but it is an interesting, perhaps, allegory of the theater and opera and design. It was in Santa Fe, uh, and we were doing The Flying Dutchman. 
And uh, as some of you may know, the Santa Fe has an open, open theater at the back and at that point overhead. So one often in the summer saw thunderstorms kind of coming and crossing in the back, which is always very dramatic. And the opening night of Flying Dutchman, there was a thunderstorm appeared, and instead of going this way, it sort of came at the theater. <laughs> and um, everybody was, you know, slightly concerned as to what would happen. At the and so they did the overture, and then they, the scene happened where the Dutchman is, as it were, sort of summoned up. Um, and just as the music was building towards the big um, chord that heralds his arrival, the thunderstorm suddenly broke right over the theater. There was a huge bolt of lightning, a huge crash of thunder. There was no rain, but there was a sudden, almost a sort of tornado-like gust of wind that came through the theater. And at that moment, uh, as was planned from above, from the, from the pipes above, were pieces of red sail, torn pieces of red material that were to come down on the stage. The wind picked this all up and blew it as m into the audience, <laughs> which was like quailing from the thunder, <laughs> quailing from these red things flying around. And then it all sort of died down, leaving Jimmy Morris standing in the middle of the stage going, what was that? <laughs> it was the most exciting moment I've almost ever had. In the, <laughs> the red pieces were cut, of course. Afterwards, they never appeared, and it was never <laughs> quite the same. So, you know, I sometimes watch uh, the opera singers uh, on stage doing frankly, scary things. They're climbing ladders, they're up on a platform up high, or they're like poor Tosca, they're jumping to their deaths or flying to their deaths. Do you ever ask them if they think they can do all that? Oh, yes. Yes, you, you both ask them and you are very, very careful about their safety. That is, uh, that is a very important um, consideration. <laughs> I did work with a German director who was always asking, you know, think people to climb up this and climb up that, and he said, well, yes, but they have to have a harness and, you know, all of these things. And he kept saying, safety, bah! <laughs> um, <laughs> but I don't feel that's quite the right attitude. I mean, you, and because, you know, I mean, it's always easy for designers and even directors. I mean, we don't have to appear on stage except on occasions like this. Um, we can always stand in the back. The performers are the ones that have to be there in front of the public, and it is part of your job to make them comfortable and to make them secure it so that they can perform at, at, at a proper level. So this is, a, this is an important consideration. And I find singers amazingly um, active and interested, and if you can also, instead of ordering them to do something or demanding that they do something, you invite them into the process and you, you, you explain to them what this effect is supposed to be and what they are supposed to be doing and can they contribute and they often can to the idea and then they perform it with conviction and, and skill. So how do you do a new set for an opera that you've done before probably even more than once? A Boheme, a Carmen, it's like the third, the fourth, the eighth time you've done a, a set. How do you make it Different. How do you approach it differently? Well, I mean, I could do bohems for the rest of my life. Um, you, you, you approach it differently because you're a different person. Even if you have, um, even if it is a fairly recent thing that you're do, redoing. And these operas, I mean, that's the great thing about working in operas and with great operas, whatever that means. Um, they are inexhaustibly rich emotionally, and you will never get to the bottom of them. Um, I mean, when I was, I had the, both the pleasure and perhaps a sort of Albrecht's curse of doing two ring productions in the United States. And um, the first one I did, which was uh, in San Francisco, of course, you, you know, you take on this 16 hour drama about the creation and end of the world, and you go, oh, how am I going to? Do this? How are we going to do this? And one of the things that I kept telling myself is, you're never going to be able to do it all. So don't worry about that. Commit to it. 
at this stage of your life, in this degree of where, where your emotions, where your intellect is, completely discover it. It will open up in front of you. It will reveal a certain level of things that it's ready to reveal to you and you're ready to receive. And you do that. And then six years later, you do the ring again. And it's a whole different thing. So indeed, I welcome doing pieces over and over again because I just it's just interesting for me to observe myself observing them. Is it, um, is it easier to work with a dead composer or a live one? This is a fine place. To, it, <laughs> since we have one here, it, the, trouble with working, the trouble with working with live composers is actually that you don't hear the music right away. I mean, because... You, you know, you can hear it on the piano, you can hear it pl played by the composer and sometimes sung by the composer. Um, so you don't, because when you're doing a piece like Bohem or Carmen, you listen to it, you study it, you listen to it with a libretto, you involve the text in your comprehension, and then you can just sit back and listen to it and let the sort of unconscious um, aspect of the piece take over. And that comes with the orchestra, I mean, with the voices in the orchestra, too. And you, you, it's a crippling, actually, uh, problem that when you're doing a piece, because you don't, you're not designing the libretto, necessarily. You're not designing the narrative. You are, I mean, you are designing those, but you are designing the piece, and the piece really exists in the orchestra. And that's even, as, as, as I think Abby said in the, in the video, when you're working on a piece you don't, that you know, or has been recorded and so on, but you don't know what your production has until you get to the orchestra, and that comes very late in the process. And, um, I mean, one of the first rules that I always try to tell myself and don't follow is don't change things at the piano dress because it will look in... It will, the same thing will look entirely different with an orchestra. Uh, but by the time you get there, then if you do want to change it, it's too late. But the reporter in me must ask a follow-up question. Yes. Not all live composers are giving you something that you can't listen to on a CD. There are some fairly notable live composers who have done things that you... So I'm asking you a harder question. <laughs> do, do they talk back? They, well, do we have time to tell you a quick story? Yeah, one quick story. Dominic Argento, uh, Mark Lemos, who you saw in the video, and I did a production of um, The uh, Voyage of Edgar Allan Poe, which had been in Sweden, which had been done in the United States. And um, we did it, and, and we sort of ignored everything that Dominic had said about the... Uh, metaphor of the piece, and it was all supposed to be set on a boat, and didn't do any of that. And um, <laughs> we did the, we did the, you know, the music and the text was all there. So we were <laughs> sitting there, and then the intendant of the house said, uh, Dominic is coming to the um, rehearsal today. I thought, oh, God. And um, <laughs> so we did it, and then, then uh, he came back, and he said, uh, Dominic would like to see you up in the green room. So Mark and I went up to the green room, and um, he said, he's a very nice gentleman, he said, I have learned more about myself from this production than any production of my work I've ever seen. And I think that was almost the highest compliment that I've ever received, because he, we, in a certain way, we could see more of it than he could because it was his unconscious that was unconscious and it was us who were finding his unconscious and showing it to him. Thank you so oh, much. Good. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Stephen Wadsworth. In the nearly 30 years since Spate Jenkins took over Seattle Opera, 
The company has gone from an annual menu of 28 performances of six operas on a budget of $3.5 million to a peak of 49 performances of five to eight operas on a budget of $29.5 million. He has presided over 21 complete ring cycles and over 1,000 performances at all, of, uh, at all but six of which, we estimate, he has been present. All ears, eyes gleaming in the dark, visiting his lead singers before, during, and after every single show, and after the last 650 or so, meeting the audience in open-ended post-show talkbacks, all with overflowing crowds, conducted in his inimitable style, the best professor you ever had, cloned with a revivalist preacher, a self-deprecating comedian, and an Atticus Finch-like defender of the right of artists to make their own decisions, completely serious, completely engaging, and completely fun. That passionate relationship with his audience in Seattle and in the opera world at large is the key to Spate's remarkable achievements. The vast knowledge, the gleeful intelligence, the charm, the frankness and warmth, the razor-sharp sense of people, the utter fearlessness, the ready laugh, the almost unimitatable speech patterns, <laughs> though many have tried, and the unparalleled enthusiasm for the art he serves have made him irresistible to the listener and the reader for over 50 years as impresario, as writer, critic, television host, regular panelist on the opera quiz, an audio commentator, and behind closed doors as a forceful advocate of the arts uh, at the city, state, and national levels. Spade has given career-defining breaks to many artists, and he has remained loyal to us, really turned us into who we are, provided us with an artistic home, regular work over long periods, abiding friendship, and a creative brilliance, specificity, generosity, and simple love as a producer, which my grateful words could never fully describe. I do a staggering imitation of him, but I'll defer instead to a consortium of admirers on the screen. He seems to have limitless energy. It's evident in the very quick speech. Well, I don't know, Cheska. I don't know if you should be doing that. <laughs> now, Sherry? Going 100,000 miles an hour. Ah, uh, Darren, uh, 120 minutes. Don't exceed 120 minutes. It's fantastic. It's going to be great. I, 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 I just can't stand it. He's kind of an evangelist for opera. He talks the gospel of opera. I discovered opera when I was six years old. My mother said to me, oh, it's where people sing where they normally should talk. And I said, what do they sing about? And she said, there's a story of a woman who is put on a rock and surrounded by fire. And she has sisters who fly through the air. And I got up and ran around the table and I was told to sit down. And I said, that's fantastic. And then the Met came to Dallas, a spectacular Rigoletto. And afterwards, when I went home, I can remember this just as though it were yesterday. I said to myself, this is my life. For a while, my parents liked the idea that I was interested in opera, but by the time I was about 10 or 11, my father realized it was serious. I didn't want to be a singer. I didn't want to be a conductor. And he kept saying to me, what do you want to do? Just sit in an orchestra seat and look at it all the time? He knew he loved opera, and he wanted to be around it all of his life. And so the first way he found to do that was to write about it. He was an editor of Opera News in the 70s. He was the music critic of the New York Post, and he was the TV host for some of the earliest Metropolitan Opera television broadcasts. After I did that for two years, I was out here lecturing on the ring. After one of the talks, there was a lady on the board, Beverly Brazo. She said, we want you to come see the search committee. And I literally, honestly, didn't know what a search committee was, nor for what they were searching. And the rest is history. I know it was foolish with the lack of experience to take over a big company, but I never had any doubt because the one thing I knew was that I knew opera. 
His passion for opera is such that it energizes everybody who's around him. It was a learning process for him, working in all aspects of the opera and the company. We did Orfe in 1988, and Mark Morris and his original group, we staged the overture, and then we cut it after the dress rehearsal. We were up until four in the morning, and Spate was the life of the party, anticipating problems, just being a brilliant and extremely spontaneous collaborator. Because I was relatively new in my career when I met him. I thought that everybody else was like Spate. Boy, was I mistaken. I arrived at the apartment that they had arranged for me in Seattle, and the beds were unmade and dirty. I had only one phone number, and I was so embarrassed, but I called Spate Jenkins. He came over, he helped me strip the beds, helped me put the laundry in the machines, helped me make the beds. Which is not exactly what most general directors do. Most do not sit in rapt attention at 85% of staging rehearsals. Spade Jenkins actually sits in the room with you from the first rehearsal to the last. What I do as a general director came about because I didn't know what most of them did. So when we did the first opera here, it seemed logical to go to as many rehearsals as possible because I wanted to learn. And some people might consider that odd, but considering the fact that the man has an encyclopedic knowledge of opera and one of the most supportive souls, it really makes the experience feel very safe. If you go to a performance, it looks very Seattle, the audience. You'll see people in all manner of dress, and everyone's equally accepted. And you'll see Spate at the top of the entry stair greeting everyone. When they first did Turn of the Screw, and he wasn't sure how it would go over, he decided to do a talk back after every single show. I simply didn't want to get all the letters that would come in. I thought it would be better to answer the questions right then. Well, it was such a hit that he's done it after every single show, including Goethe Demeron. It's an institution, I think, of which Seattleites are quite proud. Everyone's aware of the reputation he's built for Seattle Opera, particularly in the Wagnerian world. As everyone knows, Spate really is a descendant of Richard Wagner. You do know that Wagner's birthday is an office holiday in Seattle. When Spate puts on a ring cycle, it becomes this community celebration, and it's very much what Wagner intended. Frankly, if you can do Wagner successfully, you ought to be able to do anything else, because nothing is any harder. He approached me about becoming part of the new ring cycle. And he said, I want you to sing your Fricka. I'm interested in what you have to say about this part. And he gave me a year and a half to decide, which I thought was remarkable. And I thought, I want to work with somebody who has such integrity. I do trust my feeling about voices. And I don't really care what anybody's done or where they've been. If I really believe a person is good, then I'll put them on. Some other places will make you feel like you're underneath them or you're working for them, where Spade makes you feel like he's so happy to have you there at that company. I told him that one of my dreams was to do War and Peace, and he immediately embraced it. I said that I had to have a good many Russians in the cast. And so I went to Leningrad and to Moscow, and I heard all the singers. And of course, 1990 was in the height of perestroika. So we were watching the Soviet Union fall as we were doing a piece that had such great political ramifications. When the curtain came down at the end, and the entire audience stood up instantly and cheered. We knew we really had something. Spade just told me to do my best and that he trusted me. After I delivered my first draft, he said that the music that I'd written for the little girl at the beginning was that of a woman. And how was she going to turn into a woman if she'd already sung the music of a woman as a child? That was so smart. And I was mad at myself that I hadn't caught it. He is an extraordinary force for good, not just in Seattle, but in the industry. Totally, totally dedicated, 365 days out of the year. At the end of Go to Demeron, I pulled him out on stage, and I've never in my life heard an ovation like that. This was a city saying to this man, thank you for years of loving and curating of an art form that we had no idea we loved so much.
It's now my great honor to present to one of America's most delightful operatic resources and one of its greatest, Spate Jenkins with the 2011 NEA Opera Honors Award. Thank you very much for that reception, and I so much appreciate all the wonderful things that were said on this video and have been said and that Stephen did, and I so much appreciate what he said. I'm, I feel that it's all too much, but I'm grateful. I'm very grateful. I want to talk first tonight about the National Endowment. The National Endowment, I think, is very, very important to the United States. I think it's important for us to believe that it is, it is significant. There have been times in the past when there have been difficult moments and we have fought for it. And we must fight again if we have to. Because the National Endowment is, the, it, what the National Endowment is, is when the people are speaking through their government for the arts. They're saying something very simple, art matters. This is what the National Endowment does because it is this organization for us. And it's very, very significant. I really, tonight, I, I'm, I'm not gonna go through a, uh, a whole series of operas that we've done or anything else because that's been said. I do want to say that, that when John Covet, when John was talking about, when they were talking about the chairs, it was in Seattle where those chairs were on the walls. <laughs> I remember those chairs and I got asked a lot about those chairs and I just said, they're chairs. That's what John says, they're chairs, they're up there. It was a trovatore, I remember very distinctly. Uh, but in order, for, in order for me to get here tonight, I want to, I want to talk about how you can, how, at least how I feel that, that what has been the success in Seattle. First of all, I've had a board that has supported me absolutely in every way all the way through. However controversial, whatever controversial we've done, whatever difficulties we've done, my board has always stood behind me. I've never had the least problem there. I also have a staff that has worked very hard. We've worked together to bring the greatest possible opera uh, to Seattle, to the Northwest, uh, they have, and many of the people in the staff have worked for me for 20 years, and they worked for Seattle for 20 years. Uh, I think that, of course, with singers, conductors, directors, my job, as I see it, is to welcome singers, conductors, and directors to Seattle, and to make them understand that the opera we do there, the performances we do there, are tremendously important that they are significant and that they can change opera even if we are in a, in a small corner of the United States. It's very important this and I think what they must feel about it is, is how important it is what we're doing. Our audience is also remarkable. Seattle is the, one of the, is the smallest metropolitan area with such a big opera company. We only have three and a half million people in our metropolitan area but we have a wonderful audience, and I'm grateful to them more than I can say. Stephen mentioned that we've increased our number of performances over the years. They have come, and they have supported us, and I'm very grateful for all that. And finally, I, I want to say that I'm very thankful uh, to my family, to my wife, Linda, to my two children, Spate and Linda, and Lindley, sorry, <laughs> who, who uh, have put up with my absolute fascination with opera all these years. Thank you. Jenkins is that he's an avid Mariners fan, so it's in that spirit that I say that at the top of the second, when I checked a few minutes ago, the score was tied 2-2 in oh, the World good. Series. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Spade Jenkins, I want you to take yourself back to the beginning of your career as an opera impresario. Up until that time, you'd been a critic, a critic, my God. Those are not people who are necessarily beloved by the artists or the boards or... And you get invited to become the head of this opera company. So you're back there, you're new. Do you remember a disaster? 
Oh, yes, I remember a disaster very well. I, I was going to say about the critic part when you said it is that the critic actually helped me because when I came to Seattle, everybody said, he's only a critic. How can he run an opera company? <laughs> well, guess who they said it to? They said it to the newspaper critics. <laughs> so the newspaper critics then became much more positive to me in what we were going to do. <laughs> so... That's the, uh, a great story. Oh, yeah, I remember the disaster. I, actually, the first opera I ever cast uh, was the Ring, of, the Ring of 1983, which was actually my predecessor's production, and I cast the Rheingold. And I cast it differently, and I had a very fine uh, bass baritone as Votan. I was sitting in, at those days, I sat in a box, when I, what they'd done before me. Now I sit in the audience, but I was sitting in a box. And the very first thing the Votan sang that demands anything, which happens about three minutes into his first scene, he went up to the top note and lost his voice. Lost his voice. I mean, lost it completely. And I was so new, I didn't have any idea what to do. I just sat there and watched in horror as the second scene progressed. And he was basically talking. And I knew this was the end of my career. <laughs> uh, I, I knew that I would never go beyond this because what was to happen? I mean, there couldn't be anything worse than this. And because I was so new to it, I just sat there. Because, as you know, Rheingold doesn't have an intermission. So I just sat there in horror through the entire Rheingold. And it never came back, of course. It was there. It was lost. And I, at the end, I, I didn't know what to do. I was just desperate. And people were quiet. They were polite. <laughs> they didn't boo me. They didn't say anything at that point. And so, so, so what would what, you... Have... What, did I, what, well, I, well, let me just finish what I did, because it's very, very fortunate, mm. because that, I, I was so desperate. I went home, and I thought, I happen to have Tom Stewart's phone number in, San, in, uh, San, in uh, uh, Santa Fe. And the next morning, I was too late that night, I was afraid to do it, the next morning, Evelyn Lear, who was here today, I don't know whether she's here tonight, but it was wonderful to have her, I called and said, Evelyn, is Tom there? And she said, yeah, he's taking a shower. And I said, well, could he come to the phone? And, I said, and he said, yes, he could. And he came in and I said, I told him, I said, I'm desperate, can you come to Seattle and sing Valkyrie? And he said, sure. So I think my career was saved with that, with that trip, coming well, out and doing, doing Valkyrie and well, Siegfried. What did you learn from that experience? What would you do oh to differently today? Well, I mean... Other than go backstage. Okay, but what else? What did well, you, you have... First of all, you have a cover. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, that is my Hello. only time in the ring. <laughs> you know, there, there are a lot of roles in the ring, and I cover the bear. <laughs> I mean, not just the forest bird, but I believe in covering the bear. I cover <laughs> everybody in the ring. Because when you do the ring a lot, let me tell you, Something's going to happen at all points. I've had, you know, I could go on and on about that. I've had a lot of things happen, but that's what you do. You start off with it, and, you know, then you're, you know, if you have to do it, then you get up, you go back, you bring the curtain down, I suppose. I'm Actually, knock on wood, I've never had another singer lose his voice on stage like that in all these years since, in 29 years since. You've had some interesting injuries, though, right? Oh, very. <laughs> very. Um, you know, most people don't know you were trained as a lawyer. You graduated from Columbia Law School just a couple of years around the time that, that Ruth Ginsburg did, Justice Ginsburg did. And then you went into the JAG Corps. So how did you get from the JAG Corps to the opera? Well, I never really wanted to be a lawyer. I mean, I, I was a lawyer because my family thought I ought to have a profession because they couldn't. They, as we said earlier in this thing, they didn't know what I was going to do in opera. So I had a degree. And so when I got out of the JAG Corps, I just didn't want to practice. And... So my father said, all right, you, 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 you can write. I'd already done some writing. You know, you can write. Go to New York and see if you could do something in a year. I was just getting married, and he said, this was 1966. He said, I'll support you. I'll send you $150 a month. <laughs> I mean, that you don't laugh very much, but $150 a month, even in 1966, was not so much. And I went to New York, and I started publishing almost immediately. I mean, I got stories published, and so that's how I got there. So... In this job as head of the Seattle Opera, you've had to deal with a lot of divas, and I'm really not sure what you call a male diva. Devo. A devo, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Except other than difficult, that is. Mm -hmm. um, so could you, without giving us any names, I wouldn't want to get you in that much trouble. You want to give us a, a diva story or two, or a devo story? Well, you know, it's a funny thing, and I'm not being just glib about this. I, I thought you were going to ask 
slightly a different way on this. But, you know, in Seattle, I believed, uh, uh, let me tell the story that I think governs what our company does. Um, in 1968, Birgit Nilsson, the great Wagnerian soprano, gave an interview to the New York Times in which she was angry at the Met and angry, to, angry at one of Mr. Bing's assistants. And she said at the time, songbirds sing when they're happy. And I'm not happy, and so on and so forth. I remembered that. And when I came to Seattle, one of the things I talked about, and I've repeated it many times to people that have come in to work at the company, that I believe in that. And our job, when people come, is to make them happy. If they are difficult, and I've had some people that are difficult, and particularly what I call difficult is not difficult with me, but difficult to the wig maker, difficult to the to, to people they have to work with. I may not well bring, I may well not bring them back. But while they're there, the job of my staff, the job of everybody that works for me, is to make them happy. And so you'd be surprised how many so-called difficult people have walked through Seattle and given us no problems whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And that is really the truth. You know, if you ask me for a diva story, I know one or two that have been difficult who haven't been back, you know, who've, who've been, but it's always been, it's never been, you know, it's never been something we couldn't deal with. And that's really, so I, I mean, I, I think there's a much an exaggeration. Let me finish this one thing. Somebody once asked me, it's just kind of like this. They said that I was in, it was in I came in, had to go to Houston for something. And this guy said to me, well, tell me the latest a uh, big story, the big fight you had in Seattle. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? And he said, the big diva, the big divo fight, the fight. And I said, well, where do you work? And he said, Tiffany's. And I said, well, tell me how many people you've been fighting with at Tiffany's. And he said, well, that's completely different. You're in opera. I said, no, it's not. No, it's not. We have perfectly normal people in opera who happen to be, <laughs> who happen to be actors and singers. And if you just work with them, I don't have any such story. Um... I wonder, uh, you said in the film why you sat in every rehearsal at the beginning. You didn't know what the, you were doing. And you really, you, you really oh, but it's, it, it worked. It was a good idea, I right. think. It, but, and do you, you still do it, don't you? Yes, ma'am. And why do you still do it? Because I think that it's important. I, I, I have a whole lot of reasons for this. But one thing is that in any good re in a rehearsal of an opera, there are two in the rehearsal, there are two bosses. When you start an opera, there's only one boss, namely the conductor. But when you're rehearsing, you've got a director and a conductor. Now, there are times, not all the time, when a director and conductor have absolutely different ideas. And I would prefer to deal with those ideas right there, to, to negotiate between them. I also think that it's important because directors have wonderful ideas, and sometimes they have ideas that, that, that are, and, and I, my job, as I see it, is to stand behind what I present to my public. I represent the public, and, and I stand behind whatever we put on the stage in Seattle. Therefore, if a director does something with which I violently disagree, I would rather be able to tell him right then, at that moment, after we finish this the individual rehearsal, and talk it out. I don't say that everything we do on the stage is what I want. That's not true, because he can argue me out of my position. But I've got to argue about it. I've got to find out about it right now. Because I don't understand the going to an opera at the piano dress or the piano and, and saying, oh, that's wrong, do it again. They can't. Nobody can change at that point. You've got to hit it when it's hot. You've got to talk about it at that point. And that's why I think it's important to come to, to, to rehearsals. I read somewhere that you never get off an airplane without converting somebody in the airplane into at least <laughs> trying to see an opera. Well, How do you not? do that? How do you do that? Why not? <laughs> well, you, you know, you start out with whoever's sitting next to you. If you say something and they come from Seattle, I don't worry about somebody who comes from somewhere else. <laughs> you know, because I can't, I can't convince them of going. I mean, if they come from Dubuque, I can't talk about it at the Dubuque Opera. But if, they, if we're going to Seattle or going away from Seattle and they come from Seattle and they say something, and I mean, you know, I don't do it to everybody, but if they say something and I'll say, have you ever been to the opera? And... <laughs> Many times they say no, and I'll say, to you, you know, it's, and then we talk for a few minutes, and I'll say, you know, you want to come to a dress rehearsal? And um, they do. <laughs> sometimes they come back, sometimes they don't, but they do come. <laughs> I mean, I, I believe in that. I think you've got to always, I mean, good heavens, an opera director, if he isn't a proselytizer, what on earth is he? <laughs> I mean, you know, or she, you know. That's we, a good it, isn't, it isn't like we're... 
it isn't like we're, you know, it isn't like we're, the, we're a baseball team. I mean, we've got to make sure that we bring people into the house to see what we do, to bring people to opera. That's what we're looking for, constantly to bring people to opera. That's why we work with kids. We introduce them. We know if we introduce a child at a young age, we can have that, we will, that child will come back to us at some point. Maybe we'll lose him in the teenage, but probably he or she will come back. So our job is constantly to work to bring more people into our art form. Well, if that isn't a good place to end, I don't know what is. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome baritone Javier Arre. Hate fortuna, 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 h
una nueva que era Son el fantón de la chita Son el fantón de la chita De la chita De la chita Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Nicholas Suravi. Thank you, thank you. I'm, I'm really proud to be here tonight, along with my wife, Marguerite, and my daughter, Marisa, to represent my mother, Risa Stevens, in this tribute from the NEA, an organization that is meant very much to her and has been close to her all of her life. The first time I saw my mother on stage was, well, I think I was six years old, and it was a matinee at the Metropolitan Opera. And I was seated in the third or fourth row of the audience next to my grandmother, Sadie, and the curtain went up on Hansel and Gretel, my mother was playing Hansel. <laughs> you can imagine my confusion. <laughs> the next time was as the dazzling Carabino in The Marriage of Figaro. This was followed shortly by Der Rosenkavalier. <laughs> I was standing in the wings, off stage left, right over here somewhere off stage, and as the first act curtain went up, revealing my mother, now playing Octavian, in bed with Eleanor Stieber <laughs> as the marshalin. I was assured that this was normal for opera. My mind was finally put at ease watching her as Carmen. As I got older, I, I learned something about the purpose of this particular musical art form. And that was that it was not merely to tell a story, but through sound to transport us closer to what some people might call the divine. I learned this while listening to the final trio of voices just before the final curtain of Der Rosenkavalier. I thought, why is this so touching? It was because of the mix of three female voices, and one of those voices was a mezzo-soprano playing a young man. That last glorious and thankfully extended moment, which is really about the passing of the mantle from the marshalin, the woman of a certain age, to the younger generation, seemed to be suspended above the stage, even after all three of these characters had left. And a young servant came out to snuff out the candles, and the curtain fell. Today, whenever I hear that trio, the well inside me overflows because I understand what it means to be human. The video you're about to see was shot just a few months ago, and it is clear that at 98, my mother's love for this art form and the respect for the people who produce it, who compose it, who design, build it, light it, who conduct, play it, and perform it, and you, the audience who love it and listen to it, that her respect for you has never, ever waned.
Her charisma was unbelievable. When she just walked out onto the stage, you heard her before you heard her. It had a dark hue to it, and yet it had a brilliance. It was light and comical enough to go on film in a light-hearted romantic comedy. And then it was smoky and dark and smoldering enough to sing the most haunting Carmen you can imagine. It's not like a lot of singers that you go to and you just want to hear them sing. You couldn't take your eyes off her. The voice, the technique, incredible beauty. I mean, there's nothing she couldn't do. We had a, one of those long kitchens, you know, in the tenement houses. And the next room was a player piano. And my dad used to sing along with the rolls of music that he used to play. And one day he said to me, Risa, come on, join me here. And all of a sudden my mother said, Chris, I think Risa's got a voice. Like many other singers, she had to go to Europe. There was no way that a young American singer could learn and really progress in the United States at that time. I had no money, but Anna Schoen Renee, who was my teacher at Juilliard, paid for the whole thing. She had great faith in me. When I was growing up, there was always a picture of Risa and my mother and Rosenkavalier on the mantel. And I heard these stories about life in Prague and there was this mythical Risa Stevens. Probably the greatest thrill of my life was the Met debut with Harriet Hendricks and Lotta Lehmann. Risa Stevens turned mezzos into superstars. We're all grateful. The combination of the voice, the dramatic integrity, the courage, the beauty. Some of us had to work a lot harder on how we costumed ourselves and everything to sing those roles. And strange, uh, there were many people at the vet who discouraged me. Dufreya, for instance, he said, you'll never do as, as Jalala. You're much too tall. At the Met 100th anniversary, I sang Mon Cœur Souvra which is, of course, one of her great arias. And sort of halfway through, it dawned on me, you know, oh, my God, Lisa Stevens is sitting behind you. <laughs> I saw her 51, 52 at the Met when she did the wonderful Tyrone Guthrie Carmen. She was Carmen, that was it. She even advertised cigarettes. She had been a famous Carmen from the 40s on, but in 1951, she completely restudied the role and reconceived the role with Tyrone Guthrie. I recently was looking at a video and the way that she reads the cards and she pulls herself up. Jose. to read what they say the and just that subtle physicality but it comes from such a real place in a time when opera acting was different than it is now but she's very contemporary in the way that she uses her body to express the music the text the character Carmen is one of those great operas that we hear in many different forms for violin and symphonic works and you hear this great precision I think, my gosh, I wish I could sing it like that, you know? She did. She did. If you look at the final scene, you see many, many different aspects of the character. She was very glamorous, but you could also see that she was just a little bit trashy. She was very proud. You saw her total disdain for Don Jose, and she was literally trapped by this crazy person with a knife. And she seems genuinely terrified, even with Richard Tucker. And Richard Tucker stabs her. She grabs the curtain, and she was left lying on the floor with this curtain as a kind of shroud. It was the most dramatic thing I've ever seen. My father wrote me a letter, and he said, I know how much you love Risa Stevens, and I'm enclosing a check for you to go and buy a wonderful seat to see her in Carmen. I traded it in. I did 12 times standing room. <laughs> you know, there were a lot of singers during those times who made movies, but nobody like her. Nobody with the real, legitimate, operatically trained, full throttle voice. 
She could sing Cole Porter and she could sing Jerome Kern and sang them as beautifully as she sang Carmen or Dalila. And I'm not sure how Ed Sullivan got to produce this program, but I've seen footage of her singing Getting to Know You in Russian, walking through the parks of Moscow. It was a truly golden age to be an opera singer and be part of the public culture, the culture across the board, in films, on television, when opera is more than just being the background on a spaghetti commercial. In 1961, she helped the Medivert to strike. She literally contacted President Kennedy and said, this cannot happen, they can't cancel the season. Lo and behold, God bless her, she got everybody back to working and warbling in the halls. This is someone who had just given up singing within a year, but she was the one who cared about it so much and was forceful and knew how to do it. She could persuade you to jump out the window, <laughs> you know what I mean? Her contributions after her singing career were enormous and she really is somebody who gave back. Tony Bliss said, Risa, how would you like to head an opera company? I said, are you, are you really with it? And he said, we're going to start a company of young artists from the Metropolitan Opera. When she was running the National Council auditions, she was certainly involved with the young artists. And that's what she was best at, helping them along and caring about them. She wanted them to have the courage for the stage. And those young people will never forget her for that. She got involved at the Met back in the 30s, and she has been a representative of that opera house for decades and decades. I'm not sure anyone else will ever be as much to that opera house as Risa Stevens has been. She was definitely one of the people who helped popularize opera in this country because she was such a wonderful, warm, caring personality, a real person who helped people understand that opera was for everyone. Look, I've had one of the most marvelous careers in every sense of the word. Ninety-eight years old, she still looks pretty good. My mother, unfortunately, was unable to be here tonight. Uh, traveling at her age is a bit too challenging. But she wanted to express what this particular award means to her. So, here she is. Thank you very, very much. I can't tell you what this means to me. It's probably more and more important for me to mention the fact that at my age, that this will probably be the, the last award I will receive. But it doesn't matter. That's beautiful. And it's so beautiful because it, I had a beautiful career. I thank the dear Lord for that. And uh, I've, just, I've just been very lucky. But I want to thank the NEA because believe me, the National Endowment for the War Arts, if it hadn't been for you, I probably would not, not have gone into this at all because I... I, pay, I was on the panel one time at the very beginning when they started panels for looking after uh, orchestras, singers, uh, you name it. I mean, opera companies that were starting up. And it was very difficult, very difficult. But we managed and we did it quite well. And they kept always predicting that's going to be the last time. Well, thank God it wasn't. Because here we are, many years later, and I just received an award, and if it, it, says, it says many things to me. It says many, many things to me that you cannot predict. 
anything of that sort in terms of music because there, there are certain elements that exist and, and they are important. And uh, any, and um, your National Endowment, I'm going to tell you something, you're wonderful and thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome soprano Sarah Coburn.
Hi, I'm still Rocco Landisman, chairman of the NEA, and I just wanted to come out one last time to thank everyone for making tonight possible. Please join me in thanking everyone who was involved with the video tribute, tributes, all of tonight's presenters and performers, and of course, the incomparable Nina Totenberg. But, but of course, 